where I thought Professor Summon was going with his question was, uh, given the gaps and failures that um, Allison Allen has discussed in the congressional process, and the gaps and failures that uh, Dan has identified in the regulatory process, how is it that all of our panelists expect something different <laughs> from the judicial process? Because <laughs> we know how good judges are. We're, are we supposed to say because we have confidence in judges like you, Judge Pryor? Yeah. <laughs> is, that our, is, that the, is that the answer we're supposed to give? It, that, it's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions uh, from the audience? Well, um, we, we can wrap up. What? Go ahead. I was going to allow each of the panelists to wrap up and um, give some final comments before we break. Uh, it, just, I have a question maybe uh, to, to, to all the rest of the panelists. Uh, should, there, should there be any difference in the degree of deference that courts give to agency statements that say our intent is non-preemption? That is to say, suppose there's the anti-Troy preemption preamble. Should the court then all of a sudden say, oh, that's an admission against interest, and therefore it's particularly credible? Now you know why or we should they skid more deference. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you, are you, you talking about as a general proposition? As, as a general proposition, general and it's a serious or? question. Yeah. Um, it, I don't care whether it's, I mean, well, the, I suppose the preamble stuff is settled now, but let's say rule litigation positions, AG positions, and so forth. Um, there is, in fact, you can, I mean, empirically show this. It does make a difference with respect to the SG's position in ongoing litigation. Right. I was going to start by saying empirically, you know, Eskridge's study also shows significance there, too, that namely that uh, positions, uh, anti-preemption uh, positions are given stronger Chevron deference in the um, courts of appeals. Uh, as a normative matter, I don't think that's right. Um, so. Uh, and I also, you know, I'm not sure that I uh, would buy the premise that it's, you know, against interest of the agency. There's certainly a political valence, although it doesn't hold in all of the cases. So there's a case called Spritzma, and under a conservative administration, the Coast Guard took an anti-preemption position in that particular case. Uh, there does otherwise seem to be a pretty strong prevailing kind of uh, wind of politics in this uh, type of area, but it's not altogether clear to me. And in, in particular, I think sometimes people lose sight of the fact, for example, that there were a few academics, Lars Noah in particular, who argued under the Clinton administration when the FDA took a very strong anti-preemption position and would sort of say, it's not up to us, the safety uh, issue full stop, the buck doesn't stop here, that there could be an accountability loophole strongly in that direction as well. So I guess um, that would be my worry as to both uh, aligning necessarily that the agency's interest will always be pro-preemption, and then uh, I fail to see why that should get stronger deference. As, as, I, as I tell my students uh, in, in coaching them for, for moot courts, uh, don't get up on rebuttal unless you have something to say. <laughs> I think I've said enough, thank you. <laughs> well Dan, said. Do you um, have anything else? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end very quickly because I'm not smart enough to follow Alan's advice. <laughs> um, I, I just want to, again, well, first of all, as a normative matter, again, I agree with Catherine that, uh, that, what, that an, an, uh, an anti-preemption statement by the agency shouldn't necessarily be outcome determinative, but although she's also right that it, if you observe this, the cases, it frequently is. Again, I want us to, to, to take us back to, as a practical matter, what ends up happening. Again, using the FDA as a paradigm, but it's not, it, it's, it's somewhat representative. If you look at the total NDA, and an NDA, it sounds like a new drawback application, sounds like a college application like this. Actually, it's enough documents to fill this room. Um, that's how much data is submitted to the agency. In the back, if you look at the sum total of the correspondence back and forth, by and large, the company has told the agency everything that it knows about it, and then the agency responds. But again, to expect that the agency's response back, here's what we think you should say in the labeling, is going to have a written decision that is going to go on for pages and pages of, oh, we considered this study and decided not to put this one in. We considered, I mean, they do, I mean, they do decide what the labeling is, and it is footnoted, and there is a, a scientific discussion. But inevitably, what happens is 
the plaintiff's bar comes in and says, oh, well, we found these three you know, Croatian studies that you didn't submit to the agency, so you didn't tell them everything. And then in the back and forth between the agency, there's no document that explicitly discusses this French study, so therefore it wasn't adequately, there wasn't an adequate um, discussion or the agency didn't consider it, so therefore we can litigate about that. And, and, and that's where the, where, what ends up happening. So on top of having to decide the scientific causation, basically you're asking the federal courts, and I'd rather trust the federal courts than the state courts, but you're asking the judges, and ultimately, God help us, juries, to decide w whether the back and forth with the agency was sufficient to give it preemptive effect. And that's kind of you know, where we are. I just hope that when we've got a good enough case where the court where the agency has told us to do something or not to do something, that we'll be able to get preemption. Please join me in uh, thanking our panelists for their discussion. Thank you.